Welcome. Good morning. 10.30, quarter to 11. Um, welcome to this new initiative of Acetas. It's a new initiative that in Hollywood they'd probably call it Hall of Fame or something of that nature, but um, Aceta, wanted, Aceta wanted to do something that uh, acknowledges um, uh, long-term and sustained careers of excellence in terms of uh, creativity, uh, technology, um, uh, even artistry and whatnot. And um, I think some of the parameters we were initially looking at before we, we finally come up with a name, which I hope we can in the next month or so for this particular thing, um, parameters were uh, obviously the quality of work, the relationship with um, uh, en entertainment, technology, uh, creativity, but most importantly, also um, someone who has uh, been a mentor, you know, and helped um, um, people, you know, in their careers and whatnot. And I don't think we have a better inaugural candidate uh, than our guest uh, today. And if you would uh, welcome Roger Savage. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, mate. It's a pleasure. Good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> so far. Yeah. So uh, you, you were born in the UK uh, yes. and uh, went to school in the UK. Um, can we start with um, how you got into this industry? OK, well, I was, you know, I, was, I, I left school um, and the first job I got was with Associated Rediffusion, which was a television manufacturing company that I, th I guess I was an apprentice or something because I, I, I went to school one day a week, which they sent me to, mm -hmm. sort of studying electronics. Anyway, that was getting a bit boring and um, a friend of mine worked at Olympic Studios in London, Keith Grant, who said that there was a, 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 a vacancy in their maintenance department, um, which I went for an interview and got the job. Uh, as um, a maintenance technician, I guess, uh, or junior, um, and, uh, and in that, and this, this was this would be about 1960. So at that time, um, Olympic was one of only about four studios in London that was um, recording music. It was mm -hmm. Abbey Road, IBC, which is an independent one, Olympic and Pi Studios, I think, was another. And then there was Decca, which was the, the Decca Records, which was the big classical one. So um, that was sort of... And then I, then I managed to get from the maintenance area into actually mixing or balance. I became a balance operator, mm. as they called it in those days. Mm. Um, so that was... That was, I can't remember the actual year I, it started, but, um, but it was an exciting time. It was, and um, you rose th through the ranks and became a senior engineer at um, Olympic. Well, what, yeah, one of, the, one of the engineers, I was yeah. um, recording uh, uh, at that time. There was quite a lot of Dusty Springfield, um, The Stones, and... Um, Yardbirds, quite a lot of rock and roll stuff. Can we have a have a look at some of those um, some anecdotal stories that um, are quite some of them are quite humorous. Tell us about the um, you were the first to record the Rolling Stones. Yeah, well, that I sort of fell into oh, at that time. I was sort of a junior engineer, um, and um, a guy called Andrew Lou Goldham, who was um, a, a sort of friend of mine. We used to go drinking together. He was a publicist for the Beatles. And um, <clears throat> um, I'd read about, or I heard about the Stones, this group called the Rolling Stones, that were playing at the Richmond pub. And I went down there to look at them and uh, see them. And Andrew was there and um, at the same time. And um, he went and approached them about managing them. And uh, um, he had no money to record. So we did this sort of illicit session, I guess. Because I don't think he, he ever paid for it. I can't really remember. So we did these tracks, and um, from those tracks, they got a they got a, a, a deal with Decca. Um, so it was their first single called "Come On." Yeah, it went to number, got into the top I, twenty. I yeah, it got it got them going. Well, it wasn't a great 
track, to be honest. It was a bit, um, it was a bit clean compared mm. to what they eventually wanted in their sound. But anyway, mm. um, <coughs> so um, um, it's certainly got them going. Uh, yeah. And um, and so we we can safely say you probably you did it for nothing. Yeah, I never got paid, and it was at night. <laughs> so, um, uh, no, I should have taken a percentage on that one. Now, talking about percentages, there's another, um, uh, th there's another interesting tale. Um, the last r record you made uh, as a senior engineer before you came to Australia was uh, My Boy Lollipop. Yes. With Little Millie. Little Millie, yeah. <laughs> that, was, um, that was the beginning of Ireland Records. Mm. Um, uh, the head of Ireland was I, I never it's someone Chris Blackwell Black, Chris, Chris Blackwell that's mm. right and he used to do a lot of weird stuff apart from he had this group he had this uh, label called uh, Scar no Blue, uh, Blue Beat yeah. which was Scar music which is really reggae because mm. he had a, a connection with J J uh, Jamaica and um, and he was doing we were doing reggae and uh, other comedy records he did it i remember i recorded an album on the profumo affair that'd be interesting which was very funny <laughs> <laughs> and then another one of his well-known albums was the um rugby songs by the jockstrap ensemble mm. <laughs> which was very successful <laughs> well anyway out of this came little millie and my boy lollipop which um was the first big hit for him Mate, I hope you're on royalties because it went and sold six million records and went number one everywhere, didn't it? Yeah, no, it was huge. No, no, I wasn't. Even in those days, you know, producers. It was only later that producers and and um, I suppose being an engineer in those days, you half produced it. Depend on who you were with. Um, I think it was only later that producers got royalties on on records. Right. So it was just. Um, there's an urban, Just a record. There's an urban myth about that record, and the urban myth is who played the harmonica solo, and most people say it was actually Rod Stewart. Well, you, you were there. Uh, yeah, were I someone someone wrote to me about that, and um, I thought it was Keith Ralph from um, the Yardbirds. The Yardbirds, but I, look, my memory is not what it was. So it's uh, still an urban myth, then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because all of those guys used to play on everyone else's records in those days, so yeah. you, you, um, you know, they 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 were all it was small community, you know. And you saw a lot of Jimmy Page in the studio. Yeah, Jimmy Jimmy Page used to come in and play on um, jingles actually. Sometimes mm -hmm. I, I remember, I remember him coming in and showing everyone this fuzz box, which was a you know, a small box that you plug your guitar in and you clicked on it and it was just this distortion and we all thought it was awful, you know, because you, you're trying to get rid of distortion and suddenly <laughs> someone comes in and just gives you this dreadful, horrible noise <laughs> coming out of it. So, um, yeah, it was... It was um, I, 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 I remember that bit quite quite clearly. <laughs> So um, you, um, in, in the midst of um, all this um, this party going on in London and all this music being made, you up and decided to emigrate to Australia. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I was going out with the receptionist at Olympic, um, which who was an Australian, and um, she wanted to come. She lived lived in Melbourne, and she wanted to come back. So I said, I. I'd, um, I'd come with her, and right. I eventually married her, yeah. and then came to Melbourne. Okay, so when you came to Melbourne, um, I'm sure the Assemble would, would be interested in your take on technology at Olympic, which was certainly up there. If it wasn't for the Beatles, I'm sure that uh, Abbey Road wouldn't be so prominent, and we start to forget these other places. But yeah, they're all. Every, you know, I would assume they were well equipped. And um, what was it um, like? You know, in t the technology that you were working on at Olympic, uh, as opposed to Compared when you arrived to, yeah, in well, Melbourne. Yeah, well, 
Well, actually, on reflection, Olympic was, was very, very um, advanced because it had a guy called Dick Swetnam as their chief engineer. Um, and he made the first, I think, the first transistorized console in anywhere. Right. Um, and then he went on to be Helios. Yes. Because well, after I left, Olympic moved from where, where they were, which is an old synagogue in, off Baker Street, to a new, a new place in Barnes. And th th then it became really famous. I mean, if you look at the list of albums that Olympic have done, it's mm. extraordinary. So Dick Swetnam was um, in the basement. Um, there's another guy down there called Clive Green who became KDAC. Mm. Kadak. Yep. Um, and uh, I remember Ray Dolby coming in with a, with a huge box of, which was a noise, which was his first Dolby noise reduction system, right. showing it to the, the owner, which is a guy called Angus McKenzie. Mm. Um, so, but it was still mono, although it was a stereo, I can't remember now. I think we went, might have gone to an Ampex 3 track, but it was mainly mono, mono recordings. Oh, okay. um, mm. So, um, yeah, it was, a three, was it a 3 track or a 4 track? Anyway, it was, all, it was either Ampex or, um, uh, uh, um, or the other English Scully. Scully, no sc Scully. I, I, I've, we had a Scully in, in, in uh, at Armstrong's, an eight-track Scully. But in in London, I don't think it was Scully. Um, so when, anyway, when I came to Australia, um, it was um, a, a th another three-track, and so you'd mix from three-track down to. Um, down to two track, and then you'd add something on the way. But yeah, it was it was a little bit different. Mm. Um, the microphone selection was pretty much the same, um, but of course there were no producers in at the time when I, I, I when I came to Australia. I worked at um, Telefil, which was managed by Bill Armstrong and owned by Brian Horman, um, who had court recordings. He mm. used to do all the court recordings and um, uh, I was then freelancing and that's 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 when the go label started and the go show so it was actually not a bad time to come here no it was the beginning and when you did come um, here um, which was in 1965 I, I yeah think, I think it's 65 you um, pretty fairly quickly were in the middle of it I mean Melbourne become one of the hubs possibly by and large due to your reputation coming from England and uh, coming to Armstrong's where um, even all the Sydney bands would come down and work with you such as the Easy Beats I think yeah the Easy Beats oh. yes they came down um, for their first I did um, she's so fine which was their first single mm -hmm. and um, and and Ted Albert, um, uh, you, who, who had just started Albert Productions, um, used to come down and um, bring some acts down. Um, and but the, the Go label were churning out lots of Bobby and Laurie. I belong with you was mm. was one of the first ones. So it was quite um, when you look at the number of of records, it was quite prolific. I think it was Asta Records that used to distribute the Go label. Mm -hmm. um, so I freelanced there as a, and of course, as I was saying, there was no, no producers as such uh, in the so early days. So you were the days. engineer and the producer in effect? Yeah, pretty much, because yeah. the, the, the record label would send down somebody, and I just remember often they all they do is have a stopwatch and they kept timing the same record, <laughs> the same song, and it's never going to change. But they <laughs> would always time it and make a note of the running time. That was their job. Mm. Or they thought, <laughs> I mean, trying to justify why they were there, I think. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, they wanted to make sure that you didn't run overtime because you only had three hours to do a single. And yeah. 
So some of your big successes, I think, were with, um, and some of the most successful bands at the time were Masters Apprentices. Yeah, Masters Twilight. Apprentices, Twilights. Yeah. Um, you yeah. had a hand in a lot of um, all those. Uh, Daddy, Daddy, cool. Yes. Um, but I left. So what happened is Bill Armstrong um, uh, left Telefil, and Telefil was um, behind the RSL in Ackland Street, mm -hmm. beginning of Ackland Street, opposite Luna Park. There's uh, the RSL club, and it was it's it's now called the is it now called the the Metro nightclub or something oh, okay. that space mm. um it was a good it was a nice big bigger than this room it was mm. a big space mm. um and we used to do the sunny side up orchestra in there sunny side um, which is the channel seven thing but anyway bill armstrong left and then started armstrong studios in albert road and then i joined him and then david mckay used to come down from emi in in sydney and we did um Johnny Farnham's um, mm. Sadie um, and a whole lot of it. So there was EMI and then CBS and um, and then the Fable label. Yeah. So uh, Armstrong's was a very small room. It was a, in a little terrace house compared to Telefil. But we started um, going up from multi-track and this is where Graham Thurkle um, who's a lo who, who, who came from Plessy or Roller. Mm. Um, I think he was responsible for the original um, design of the reel-to-reel. -reel. I believe so, yeah. Yeah. Very clever guy. And he used to just make multi-tracks. So we, we went up to, um, you know, um, he went up two track, four track, eight track, sixteen to twenty four mm. over the over a fair period. But and I think he was um, he was one of the first ones to, to to develop a multi track that didn't have a pinch pinch roller or pinch wheel. It was microprocessor controlled speed, which is like the Atari mm. multi track that came out later. But prior to that, most most tape to tape machines just relied on 50 hertz out of the mains mm. to, to keep the speed. And um, so Graham stuff was really quite advanced. Mm. So we used to, um, you know, buy his stuff. And, um, and then he also made um, consoles um, before we got into involved in Harrison consoles. So, so really, technically, I think we, the Armstrong's was quite advanced, right? As far as number of tracks, right? Uh, Graham Thurkle, that's we know that, that company is Optronics. That's the brand. That was the trademark. Yeah. So, Ultra. We'll and equalisers as well. Equal, yeah. So that's, in brief, that's a huge um, body of work in Australia in in, oh, in yeah. music that you've been um, involved in. Oh, the yeah, music. Yeah, but technically, I think it was um, mm. uh, it was pretty. I mean, we did buy a Scully, an eight-track mm. Scully, but most mm. of the stuff was locally made. Right. Well, uh, even a, even a, I remember a guy down in Frankston. What was his name? He made a um, um, he copied an EMT plate reverb, made one because right. we couldn't afford to buy a proper one, which was you know the stretched metal play mm. with a transducer on it and um, I don't know where he came from this guy <laughs> he just turned up with it and it worked mm. okay so with that body of uh, music um, that you'd uh, completed very successfully um, what led you into film mixing um, well, um, I, I was doing, I was mixing, I was getting, doing more music. Or, so, so we moved from Bank, uh, from um, Albert Road. Mm -hmm. We had three small terrace houses, which were all connected illegally across the roofs, <laughs> which the neighbours never knew. <laughs> they went for 112. We're 100, 
102, and then 112 and 110, I think. And <laughs> anyway, um, uh, we, 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 we went to Bank Street um, and uh, with a much bigger studio, um, and we would started to do or or orchestras. What year would this be? I think we moved to Bank Street in about 74. Right. So it was about 10 years in Albert Road and then 74. And then David Syme bought um, Armstrong Studios and um, made it into AAV, which is Armstrong Audio Video. Ray Hughes, who was a, um, a video company. Um, so it was a combination. And um, so I, I got involved. Um, so I was doing, I was enjoying actually recording orchestras rather than rock bands. I'd had enough of rock bands because the, they sometimes became a bit precious about, um, uh, the producers became very precious. You know, if you didn't have the right speaker or the right multi-track, they'd complain and like they'd expect you to change the speakers. And, or if, you know, VU was one dB out, they used to show off um, in front of the band, you know. Mm. Um, so I was getting jack of that. <laughs> um, and so I was, I was recording scores for um, uh, Man from Snowy River and um, The Light Horseman. Uh, and, 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 and that was the period that the 10BA came in, which was the tax offset for feature films. So we did um, a lot of, there were a lot more films being made in mm -hmm. Australia, in mm -hmm. Melbourne. And um, Brian May, who was um, the ABC show band conductor, um, was, um, was doing some of those. And, uh, and that's, when I, um, that's when I met George Miller and Byron Kennedy, the producers of Mad Max, because we were doing the music score. Uh, for that film, and it was a very it was a very low budget film, and um, I. Um, You're not going to tell me this was another love job. It was actually. <laughs> <laughs> it was because well, what we <laughs> I know it's really dumb, um, um, but but what, what happened is we were using a synchronizer because it was a video ha uh, at Bank Street with a, a video department and a sound department. And so um, they, they had this um, synchronizer that could synchronize picture to multi-track. So we were showing the picture and running a multi-track and recording the orchestra. And I was talking to Byron about where, where, where you're going to mix it. And he said, oh, I don't know. We, we, we might go to Adelaide. We've only got $1,500, <laughs> they've been telling me. And I said, well, why don't we, I said, well look, we can synchronize this. Um, and he, Byron was a bit of a techno nerd, you know, he, he liked all that, whereas George was just a director. Um, and by day a GP, wasn't he? Yeah, by day a, um, a doctor. Yeah. Um, so he used, to, he used to come in at night when we were mixing. So, so, what, what, so what I said to the, um, the, the CEO, of, of, which was then AAV, is, you know, could we... Could we do this mix at night uh, in the music in mixing room? Um, and it was sort of a loose arrangement. I, I don't know what the deal was, but it was very loose. And so, so we sort of set it up mixing using multi track as opposed to sprockets. Um, and it just went on for a long time because we could only do it at night and um, uh, and uh, and then we ended up mixing it down to mono because this was before Dolby Stereo started, 79 this was. But the interesting technical thing was ha how to get um, how to get the picture onto videotape because the telecine, uh, the telecine chains were only 25 frame in those days. And this is a 24-frame 
image. So we organised to have um, have the picture. Um, it was we, we went down to Riverside Studios, which was a, a film sort of screening room down by the by the by the Yarra, and so they they put the film on a 24 frame projector with the with the dialogue on on interlock sprockets and I sort of conned the um, picture truck or the video department to send their truck down and so they captured the image on a camera on a one inch video machine and we took the audio truck down and put the sound in from the sprocket so we recorded time code on both and then recorded the 50 hertz off the wall or out of the mains so that there was a reference to resolve it back because because you know if there if there'd been a difference in the frequency it would be out of sync mm. so we used that as a reference and then we went back and just used time code and um, just mixed it um, and then um, this is pretty progressive um, thinking for the time wasn't well it, it? was because I got Graham Thurkle involved on how are we going to do this and it was his idea. And um, yeah, it was because I'm not sure in, in those days, um, certainly Hollywood weren't into multi tracks or synchronizers or anything like that. So it might have been one of the first feature films. Yeah, and this, this of course, uh, brings us to the next um, question. Uh, George Lucas contacted you and uh, wanted to take you to America for Star Wars. Well, after. After Mad Max, well, that was yeah. After that was after Mad Max Two. So what mm -hmm. what happened to Mad Max One? Uh, uh, yeah. So that that was that that was a successful film. So then they had what they called Road Warrior or Mad Max Two, which was um, properly funded. And you now this Warner, as well. well, now Warner Brothers, you know, gave them money yeah. to make it properly. And so um, George and um, Byron, um, the, o the only proper Dolby stereo place was Film Australia mm. in Sydney at mm. Linfield. Mm. That was a government facility that had, I don't know, had about 10, 10 35 mil Magnatex and a projector and quite a big room. Um, and it was set up for Dolby stereo. So we, had, we went there and um, that became a sort of a sprocket mix, but we, we actually put time code on one of the sprockets so we could run a, um, a, 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 a mixing console. I can't remember what it was actually, but it, was, it, was, it had automation on it because we were, we were used to automation. So it was a bit of a hybrid, but anyway, that worked. And then, um, then that was a big hit in America. And that's when... Um, George Lucas' sound designer, uh, Ben Burt, heard it and, um, I guess, and then asked me if I wanted to come over and help. And they wanted to do it in, in, in San Francisco. They'd, they'd, they'd mixed the first two Star Wars in, in, in Hollywood and they didn't have a good time because in Hollywood it was very union I mean, you, you, if you weren't a mixer, you weren't allowed to touch a fader. Um, so they, they had the mixers who were very powerful and then the editors or the sound designers. And um, because I, I asked um, Ben Burt, I said, well, how come you invited, you know, asked me to do it? And he said, oh, well, we didn't want anyone from Hollywood coming up to San Francisco and we wanted to mix it on a, on a, a Neve... Um, they had sprockets, they didn't have, did they have a multi-track? Anyway, they were using automation, so they were sort of doing what we were doing, or trying to do what we were doing. So they just didn't want um, any of the, of the disciplines from Hollywood there. Okay. And um, so that was Return of the Jedi. So I, I worked on that for about 12 weeks. And then came back to, when I came back, I started Sound Firm. 
And that's my next question. So you started Sound Firm, and um, I think everybody's getting the impression that you've not just been a, um, a balance engineer, a, a mixer, or whatnot, but you've also been a technology creator. Or yes, I'm a bit of a bit yeah. of a victim on, on as far as <laughs> getting onto the bleeding edge. Yeah. And so I guess, I guess establishing Sound Firm enabled you to also to, um, to get involved in uh, creating technology and also not just devices but methodology and, and whatnot. Yeah, well, coming from the music, uh, coming from a music background, the, it was so far advanced, the music industry compared to the film industry, mm. which is really, you, you have to say, that's Hollywood. Yeah. Because that's where it all, it's the only place... And, you know, they, they hardly move from mono uh, optical sound until Dolby came out. Um, so the sound side of things didn't, was not very progressive. And um, it was, as I say, all on 35mm mag, not on automation. So seeing this the ability of, of, of being able to synchronise non-sprocket stuff... Um, and having automation and all the things that the music industry had, I, I could see huge advantage mm. in just getting a better product. So I, so I adopted this this synchroniser that we used at Soundfirm was developed by Graham Thurkle, mm. and it synchronised the Telecine chain to Umatics and video machines. And um, so I wanted to adapt it to control um, uh, projectors. Uh, so, so to um, you know, to mix because um, we wouldn't always have the picture on videotape. There would be times when someone would bring in a roll of film. Mm -hmm. um, so I got Graham's son Gerard. Um, to write software and redevelop the editron to be um, to be able to um, synchronize multi multi speeds and uh, multi formats, which was the, the 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 base of that whole system. So we had a sort of a music console uh, and um, and a multi track and a film projector and uh, dubbers and so forth. So I think that's what made it... That's pretty leading edge. Yeah, that, that's what made it really powerful, as yeah. opposed to having banks and banks of, you know, those bloody sprocket machines. Yeah. So with, uh, with, all, with, with all of this going on at Sound Firm and your progress, um, gee whiz, you, um, you worked on some pretty, um, pretty successful um, films. M Muriel's Wedding. Muriel's Wedding, yeah. yeah Crocodile uh, Dundee. Yeah, Crocodile Dundee and um, Strictly Ballroom, <laughs> um, which were those, I think, that were, that were in the 80s in mm. Melbourne. Um, yeah, it was a good time, actually. There was some Young Einstein, which you don't hear about much, but that was a fun film to work on. Mm. Um, and were you, were you at the coalface? You were mixing these films yourself? Uh, yeah, I was, at that stage, I was... Mixer, I was mixing, and um, it was a small company. There mm. was only about six of us there, um, and um, we used to do one film at once, and then that when that was finished, you know, another film would come mm. on. Mm. Um, easier days than now um, to manage it, anyway. Mm. Um, but yeah, we used to. Um, uh, we, we, you know, and we had a few Americans companies that used to come over just to do their sound mm. because in those days in, in, in America, if you wanted a decent, certainly if you wanted a Dolby stereo track, you, you had to go to a big dubbing stage like Sony or Fox or mm. uh, Universal and they were like three mixers. You couldn't have one mixer. You had to have three mixers, and it was like $1,000 an hour and stuff like that. So there was no one who'd set up for the low-budget stuff. No. So, um, 
different now, of course. Mm. Um, so we, we sort of um, offered a service that, um, that was quite competitive dollar-wise. And, of mm. course, the, dollar, the Aussie dollar was much lower than the American dollar. Mm. Um, so we were, we were, di we were quite busy. Mm. And um, at this particular point in time, uh, I believe uh, uh, not only um, have you won a number of awards, including two BAFA, that's the British industry, isn't it? BAFTAs. BAFTAs, yeah. yeah. And you also were nominated for an Academy Award. Yeah, that was for um, Moulin Rouge. Oh, was it? Yeah, Moulin Rouge. Mm. Um, and when we mixed that... Oh, well, we'd moved... Sound Firm started in Bank Street, opposite AAV, mm. and then we moved to um, Port Melbourne. Um, and then we also opened up in a Sydney operation, um, which was in Fox Studios. So we were renting a space from Fox, and uh, that's when we did Moulin Rouge there. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the other, the BAFTAs were Shine, which was uh -huh. done in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. um, and House of Flying Daggers, I think, was it? Which is mm. a Chinese film. Okay. Now, um, in due course, you also opened a facility in Beijing. Yeah, well, we started doing... Um, yeah, in 2003, I think, or 2004, mm. uh, we, we, we sort of fell into a Chinese film called Rumble in the Bronx. Um, was it Rumble in the Bronx? It, it was an early Jackie Chan film. Oh, OK. Um, it's his first sound film, actually. First film he hadn't, had, he hadn't dubbed. So, because um, I remember, he shot it in Vancouver. And um, it's the first time... Because they all, in the early days, those Hong Kong films, they all used to just do them mute. Or they would, they would just... Often they would talk rubbish like often they would count and they'd make it up later <laughs> they just one two three four five six seven eight i mean and then they just dub it um so he wasn't used to sync sound and every time i saw some of the rushes i mean the microphone would come in and then he'd bash it out the way <laughs> he didn't want to know about it he was really it was the poor old canadian sound guy was very distraught. He couldn't get his microphone <laughs> anywhere near him. Um, it was quite... And then, of course, he'd, then, then he would dub it. Um, um, so we started, we started on that film, and then... Um, and that was quite, su that was, um, quite successful. And then we, we got um, uh, uh, Zhang Yimo, who was a very big mainland Chinese director um, to do a film called Hero which was a very um, spectacular looking film um, and um, it, it was great to work with him because the, the, the Chinese have got a different different take on, on everything really in regard to sound and so forth um, and so you, you could they're, they're very experimental, particularly the, the, that 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 style of film, um, and um, so the person that came over uh, on that was um, a person called Gung Ling. So we we um, there was a lab in 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 Melbourne that now is, is now closed down, but it used to be um, uh, part of part of our at lab. Um, and we went to went over there, trying to get more Chinese work, and set up with a partner, and made a, 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 so we had a joint venture in those days, which was a bit early because there was um, there wasn't any. I think we were the first private company to get involved in film because mm -hmm. in China, the film industry comes under. Um, the the propaganda department, <laughs> right. and you can't, and because they saw film as being dangerous, 
they could educate the masses and they could be a, they could be a revolution. Mm. So anything to do with film, you couldn't, you had to have special permits for. Mm. So, because I remember when we had to get a license, Gung Ling, who was my partner, she said, we can't use the word film anywhere, otherwise they won't give you a license. So we, I don't know what she used, multimedia or something, um, which was just a way of getting around the, around the politics. So, um, so we o opened up, it was just a small, mm. a small uh, facility to do the Mandarin dubbing. Right. And then they would come to Australia to do the, 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 the main mixing. Okay. Now, um, so back to technology. So you've been behind uh, quite a number of, of um, uh, tech, uh, technology um, companies or technology development. I mean, one I know well is um, Smart AV, AV yes. um, Control Surfaces, and uh, anything else? I think um, there's been other... other yeah, we, oh, well, we actually... Eddie Tracker? Yeah, Eddie Tracker was a, a product we developed in-house. Um, I'm just trying to remember the... It would be the ni early 90s, and it was... Um, and I was using Gerard, Gerard Thurkel mm -hmm. and another guy, Gerard Graham's son, to develop this, which was really a, the, a digital editing system designed specifically for film editing, set, not picture, but sound for film so it was um it was early days for that mm -hmm. i mean i remember the cost of a five was it gigabyte drive or was it a one gigabyte drive it was about ten thousand dollars it was a and it was about this big mm. so it was storage was very expensive mm. So that was one of the problems, because I remember we, we spent a bit of money on trying to, to, to develop um, noise, re uh, not noise reduction, but um, data reduction. To, mm. to and so we, we, we developed this touch screen. It was on a plasma, uh, orange plasma screen. Um, uh, and it basically cut sound uh, to time code. Uh, Synchronized to a, an image, uh, which was on a on a on another disc. Um, so we made we did that, and we actually sold some to the ABC. Um, but look, we didn't have the money to develop it. Right. I mean, we used it on um, on on internal films, but you know you you know what it's like. You need more money to 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 actually market it than you do to bloody invent yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So it was um, something that sort of came and went. Yeah. Um, but I think it was, a, it was before, before Pro Tools, yeah. but it wasn't like multi-track based as much as they are now. It was yeah. a different system. So as we head towards concluding, um, you've had this um, um, career really over six decades if my mathematics is is correct and so you've been involved in producing a lot of music a lot of films and also as we've now learned a lot of technology mm -hmm. so uh, you've you've had a pretty full um, yeah, I've been career. Busy. Mm. Um, but I've just got one or two questions and where before we wrap up um, you've also developed the first fully accredited Dolby Atmos facility in Australia? Yes. In, in Melbourne? Yeah, in Melbourne at our facility there, we've got a, an, a Dolby Atmos room for mm. mixing. It's, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of Atmos cinemas now, but mm. this is the only um, um, re or mixing room that where you can mix and create an immersive sound mm. uh, cinema track, cinema, cinema mm. soundtrack. Right. And um, I take it you're not looking at retiring any time soon, eh? Well, I don't mix anymore, um, but um, I'm, I'm trying to um, take it easy. <laughs> It'd be, uh, at, at this particular easy. point in time, we haven't got a lot of time, but we should, um, we should uh, someone may have a, a really uh, pressing question that they'd like to ask you, so we'll, um, we'll throw it... Um, 
uh, over to the attendees here. And has anybody got a question that they'd like to ask of Roger? No? Okay, that's good. Okay, well, I'll just, I'll finish up with one. Mm. Um, what do you, we go through, we, we, we're now in this era of incredible nostalgia. And so what do you think about those who still want to make music on a tape recorder as opposed to a digital audio workstation? Or do you, or do you, you don't want to offend anybody? <laughs> oh, you mean vinyl or analog, as, uh, analog versus digital? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Um, I've never really, um, I've never really got involved in doing an A-B comparison, but I mean, um, I think, and it's difficult to discount the fact that you can't do, in, in a practical way, the, the thought of doing it analogue without fully autom full automation, certainly from what I was doing, would be just a nightmare. Mm. because the digital format gives mm. you that amazing recall on, mm. on, on, on everything. So getting through something as complicated as a, a well, even a record, um, with plug-in and so forth. But I think um, certainly the early, early CDs sounded like crap. Mm. Um, and I think it got off to a wrong, bad start digital mm. Mm. recording because of the converters, mm. eight bit, then sixteen, and then you know. Yeah. But certainly, having heard DSD, you know, the, the real high end stuff, and well, you know, as you know, the classical mm. Mm. people have adopted that. Um, I think. Um, uh, I think there's m more nostalgia involved in, in that <laughs> argument. Yeah. You know, if you if you do it properly with digitally, I, I don't think I don't think you're going to lose anything. No, no. You know, no. I mean, people want t tape saturation and stuff mm. like that, or you can get a plug-in to do that. I mm. mean, it's. Um, but look, I'm not that nostalgic about it. I'm, I'm nostalgic about that period. I'm mm. very lucky to have been around when we were recording. Mm. And going through this from mono through to multi-track, um, that's that's that was a great, uh, you know, it was a great time to mm. s to see it. But um, and finally, as a, as an example of room reverb, in, in terms of my career now, I often cite and um, play uh, a, a, a number called. Uh, done an Olympic record just to, uh, as an example of the room sound, and that's Dusty Springfield's I Only Want to Be With You. Oh, yes, yes. Did you work on that? Yes. I mean, the room at Olympic was an old synagogue. It, it was about, it was a bit bigger than this room, with maybe a slightly higher ceiling, and it looked, well, it had, you know, chicken wire mm. covering the acoustic. It looked dreadful, um, and the control room was sort of up the top. But it did have a, and, and in those days, you know, you, you um, because of the lack of tracks mm. and control later, there was a lot of movement of microphones mm. until the orchestra, like that would, that was an orchestra. Um, you know, you, you, you'd use the acoustics mm. rather than re uh, artificial reverb to get mm. the sound right. So there mm. was a lot of moving baffles and stuff like that but um it's a great example of a room yeah yeah environment, that's right. that particular record yeah well um we'll draw to a close and i think you would all agree it's been a privilege to have you with us roger oh, thank you would thank you, you thank roger thank you